Welcome to another episode of Teaching Tuesdays. This is Holly Drake with Wild Blessings. And um, today we're going to be doing part two of the Wild Garden. And I'm really excited to be able to share with you what plants you don't want to have near you and those that you want to have kind of at arm's length. So if you didn't see the, the uh, talk I gave last week on the ones you want to be best friends with and have as close as possible and how to get them there, then be sure you watch that. I'll put the link below. But welcome, I'm so glad you're here. If you are watching, just say hi and tell me what plants you don't want to have growing in your garden and why, or just tell me what it is. I'm sure it'll be one of the ones I cover and maybe not because there's quite a few invasive dreadables and some of them are dreadable edibles and some of them are just flat out toxic. So we're gonna talk about that and I'll do a slideshow later. Let me just give you a little bit of an overview um, we're going to have our tea time and my son Jordan is here from New York. And so Jordan, if you want to come join me, I want to, um, share with you some, oh. sure. So this is sumac. This is rush glabra or smooth sumac. And I know you're about to ask me, mom, I thought sumac was poisonous. Mom, I thought sumac was poisonous. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's true. There is poison sumac, but poison sumac has white berries and, the edible sumac, which is so delicious and lovely and wonderful, is rush glabra or smooth sumac. So anyway, this is edible. So what I did is I took off those berries. And here, I'll give you one sample. They um, just take one of those off and try it and tell me what and it tastes like. Me. Don't eat that. Just take one oh. of the berries off. It's very tannic, so you don't want to eat the stems. Do you, it's what a do very you strong lemon. Lemon. Okay. So that's right. And so what I did is I made sumac aid and the way you make this is a little different than a regular tea. I'm sure you really want to know. I'm dying to know. <laughs> anyway. So what we do is you have to infuse them in cold water because of these branches are and twigs are very tannic rich and very, 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 very bitter. And they're good for actually tanning hides, you know, which is what, um, uh, you know, they've been used for for centuries. Anyway, but you don't, what you do is you take the berries off, you put them in cold water, you sit them in the sun, and then you just let them infuse that lemoniness. And you make sure that you harvest them on a dry day so that the malic acid is still there and hasn't been washed off with a lot of rain. So that's, I've got a whole lot of that in there. And I've made sitar out of it, which is an amazing, um, I'll give the link to where we did a cooking demo on how to make sitar, which is an Indian Season you have you ever had sitar at a restaurant? I or think anything? so. No. Oh, it's so good. Okay, so you want to try some? Of course. Right, I'll let you pour. All right. Grace, you want to try some? Please. All right, and it's very high in vitamin C. You never have to have scurvy as long as you've got sumac around. Wow. And I sweetened it with monk fruit, so there's really um, very low glycemic index in this, and also very high in vitamin C. I'm not doing a wild cooking demo today because we have way too much to cover. Yes, way too much. Way too so, much. but I did make some acorn uh, crackers, which, if you'd like to try, try one. Um, Careful, I don't break your teeth. <laughs> what do you think? Very good. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, this was supposed to be acorn bread. This is what squirrels make when they hide acorns away. They go make acorn crackers. I haven't really heard about that. Okay. It's possible. I haven't Ooh, studied okay. squirrels. So, okay. So Jordan, where are you heading and where do you live? And tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Oh, he's this, home for this week because. Is this, is this like a, is this like a, a chat show now? We <laughs> our, I'm just proud of my son. We drink our Simac aid. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm home for Thanksgiving. I'm heading to Torino, Italy after Thanksgiving for a, um, a film event. I work in the film industry and uh, I'm going to spend a week and week and a half in Italy. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Make sure you look up foragers there so you can learn what's edible out there. It's mm. a good idea. I should do that. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah, you definitely would. It'd be fun to go with you. Anyway, thanks for, for joining <laughs> me, buddy. I sure appreciate it. And um, okay. I think. Do you have music to play me off? No, I just think you can go back to work. Is there going to be is there clapping <laughs> yeah. as I leave? Like, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This has been Jordan Drake. I'm going to tell Justin to turn his, uh, his audio down. 
Oh, okay. All right. So it's fun having my boys home this week. And I'm so proud of, the, of all of them. And um, it's just a joy. Okay. So let's see. So we had our tea and our cooking demo. I'm going to have Heather Pierre's story for at the very end because it's, it's so wonderful. And she talks about how foraging literally is why she's alive today and how her mother used to forage during the World War II in France because the Germans had taken all of the food and how that literally kept her alive. And that's why Heather's one of my dear friends today. So we'll hear that story later. And um, we'll start first with this amazing book. This book is uh, written by John Callis, who is just an absolute a phenomenal forager and a very funny author. So he kind of makes uh, Ed foraging really fun. And his books are very, very worth it. This one's called Wild Fruits from Dirt to Plate. And if you want to um, just follow along with me or get the book, I really recommend it. And what I did is I just made some notes from his chapter on how to create a wild paradise. And so bringing, there's something really exciting about going foraging and finding, you know, going off into the wild and finding the cattails and bringing home the bacon, so to speak. But to be able to have them outside your door at your very whim is is really wealth indeed. And so I have really worked at that. I have an acre, Jason, I live on an acre here in the mountains of North Carolina. And this acre, I have so been so intentional to bring so many wild edible plants here that we're not already growing. So you need to first assess what do you have. And anyway, he's got some really awesome points. And I just thought I would just read them because I don't think I can actually improve on what he said. And then we'll look at my slideshow to talk about the plants that I don't think we should have nearby. Um, I did put all of the friendship quotes on my Wild Blessings with Holly Drake Facebook group page. So if you're not a member of that group, um, there's lots of handouts and crossword puzzles and fun things that are provided at that private Facebook group. So if you're watching with YouTube and you want to join that, just contact me and I would be happy to add you. And But you have to accept to see the posts. All right. So for the Wild Garden... Um, instead of grimacing, you cheer when the weed seedlings begin to sprout. So first thing you're going to do is turn over soil in the spring as soon as it's workable and mix in some compost. And then plant your tomatoes and your peas and your peppers, just your regular garden. And don't even think about the weeds and just water it. And then wait for the magic to happen. Learn to recognize tasty weed sprouts that you want to keep, pull or pinch off the rest and grass is the biggest foe. Always pull out the grass anytime you see it. So let a few grow and study them over time. Let a few unknowns grow to maturity. And once you know what they are, pull the, out the undesirables and never let them go to seed. Okay? Because once you do, then you're stuck with their children forever. The fast growing leaves of young plants are often considered the choicest. As weeds grow, gather their leaves and stems and thin them out to eat the thinnings. Baby greens are gourmet. The thinning process allows the remaining weeds to flourish with less competition. And then harvest weeds around the base of domesticated plants. So if you have a tomato plant, you want to harvest from the base out. So pretend this is a tomato plant and you've got a whole bunch of little lamb's quarter seedlings all around its base. You want to thin next to the base so that that tomato plant doesn't have to compete with the lamb's quarter being too close to it. And so he recommends that for a two foot tall tomato plant, you want to harvest all within six inches of their bases. Cover that now barren soil with mulch. If it's a three foot tall tomato plant, you want to do a one foot circumference with no weeds around it. The goal is to grow as much weed as you can without choking out the domestic plants. So you can have lamb's quarter and amaranth and purslane and chickweed in, the, in your domestic garden where you're trying to grow vegetables as long as you give them a little bit of space. Don't harvest all of the weeds. Let some of them go to seed for sustainable yields every year. Once seeds begin to drop, spread them throughout the garden. And then when it, the, let's see, when you turn the soil next spring, the seeds will get mixed into different depths. The ones near the surface will germinate when the conditions are right. All right, so that is the wild garden. And then he has another section called the fully wild garden. And this is what he has done. And this is what I did this year because Jason said, Holly, I don't think you have time to grow peppers and tomatoes and 
and be intentional about your green beans this year and the corn and everything. Just let it go wild because that's what you are, a wild food teacher. And so that's what I've done. And so um, that's what he's done. And he has some interesting points on that. So let me share those and then we'll get to my slideshow. So he says, turn over the soil at least once um, or twice and even three times a year and water as if you had some domesticated plants there. And I know you're thinking, why would you do that when, when we're just talking about weeds and don't they just grow themselves? And yeah, they do, but they're just like, um, if the soil has been used year after year after year, you want to give it nourishment and you wanna give them nutrients. So use a broad fork, add compost minerals and lime so the weeds will really perform. This produces better quality food over a much longer period in greater quantities. If you starve them, you'll have starved plants. Without soil amendments, you will deplete your soil and there will be less produce. Water the supply soil amendment and do your thinning like we talked about before. Keep up with thinning. It'll give you so much fresh food. You can can it, freeze it, dry it, eat it. And then you introduce wild seed into your garden or your yard. Expand your diversity, which is what I want to help you with today in our class. Assess which edible weeds you already have. And then go on a quest for the ones that you want to have. Um, always bring back the seeds from plants or transplant plants that are the healthiest you can find. So I found the healthiest yarrow plants on Diane uh, Price's llama farm. And even though I have yarrow, I had never seen yarrow so beautiful. So I made sure to get some of those seeds, which happen to be right here. And we'll talk about what's on my counter at the end of class today. Okay. So then transplant the choicest immature plants so they can eventually spread their seed. Do not introduce bad seed into your garden. You'll be stuck with their children for years. Um, I have horror stories I could talk about with that. However, you know, if you stick with it, the whole key is consistency and discipline. So this I thought was extremely important. So listen up on this one. More permanent than a garden containing more uh, perennials located. Okay. You want to put your perennials around the perimeter of your yard because they come back every year. Edible landscaping is the practice of planting food, producing trees and shrubs and vines and perennial herbs on your land, planting fruit trees, nut trees, spice bushes. You can get a huge amount of free food from your own yard over time. Edible landscaping is more productive if you are disciplined. So consistency is the key. Some plants don't need any help. They're not finicky at all, but some of them are finicky. Some of them like really moist soil. Some of them like soft soil. Some of them like hard soil. So you have to kind of learn a little bit about what's their best growing conditions. And that's what I will teach you in my slideshow. Um, and you might have to transplant. This is important. You might have to transplant some plants from a farmer's garden with the soil that they were growing in. And that will keep them from being too shocked with the change of soil in your house. Um, if you are diligent, Here's the goal, guys. In the first few years of setting up the landscape, you will reach a point where there is less and less maintenance. The weeds you want will thrive, and the weeds you don't want will eventually have no seed left in the soil to grow. How awesome to be able to harvest at will from sustainable area during the prime harvesting seasons. So those were his really wise thoughts, and I really didn't think I could, could possibly improve on that. I have so much work to do in improving myself and my own land. Jason's been working with me and getting rid of this little guy here. This is a beautiful flower. Um, I think it's a beautiful seed stalk too. And they get to be about 12 feet tall. This is called wing stem. And wing stem is pretty. It's eye candy, but it has absolutely no edible qualities. It has no medicinal qualities that I know of. And so honestly, this is taking over. And so I have been so careful to just cut off all the flowers and the seeds, seed pods before spreading the seed this year. And every year I'm going to keep it up and keep it up and keep it up until these guys are gone. Because I don't mind looking at them across the road. I just don't want them on my garden. All right. I think that's kind of it. And then I'll come over and I'll share with you about my wild garden landscape. And then... Um, Yes, Jace. Which, so which slideshow would you like to present now? You're going to come. Oh, yeah. I want to, I'm still talking about the wild garden. And so okay. I want to show you the toxic ones that we don't want anywhere near us. And then we'll go into the ones that we want to have with boundaries. So it's kind of like friends that you have contained. I mean, like, you know what I mean? You want to go visit friends, certain friends on your terms, because when they come to your house, they just never leave. 
So we're going to talk about those kind of two negative ones. And the toxics, you don't want them at all. So don't forget to comment and let me know what plants you do not want. Excuse me, that is not a plant. He then, <laughs> the boys don't come home to see me. They come home to see Max <laughs> and to eat my food. <laughs> oh, he looks so cute. <laughs> yeah, <that's> so <laughs> Are you going to show jo uh, Justin? Oh. He wants to know about the plants you shouldn't have in your garden. Okay, well, I'd like, I would dog... like you to help me get rid of buttercups. Well, does, I think he does that, right? He digs up things for you. He, he does. does dig. He digs. Thank when God. he digs a hole to China, that's I, I can use that hole. And I have planted echinacea and different things in those holes because they're quite large. Thank you, Max. Thank you for all you do. We appreciate you. <laughs> Look at his paws. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm ruining the show. Enjoy. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to come over to my computer. I'll see you in a second. Let me get my sumac. That was crazy. Yeah, you know. He looks so cute. Well, can, yeah. All right. Oh, so you just narrated. Here. That's cool. Now, how do we know if it's going to be on the other computer? Oh. Mm. <laughs> No, no, no. Just a moment, folks. We'll be here in just a moment. I can go talk about what's on my counter. All right. Now you can sit down and use your. your I don't want to trip. Okay. Okie doke. Hold on a second. Yeah, it's not working. Go back up. Can we get up? Yeah. <clears throat> You're so close. Yeah. Somehow, folks, we have a technical glitch with trying to get sharing. Well, want me to go back to talking about my counter? Well, go back. Yeah, go back and do that. But I, I have to try and find out why I'm not working. So Okay, so is it is the camera on me or is it what? It's on you. You're it is okay. So. I'm live. <laughs> okay, guys. So we're still working this through. This is um, real life. <laughs> and so I wanted to share with you what I did this week. So I had a wild food luncheon on Saturday which was really wonderful. And I had some wonderful wild friends that came over and I had already uh, done the foraging for months and a lot of it had been frozen or dried. And the preserved wild um, food is something I talk about a lot. So we ate a lot from that. And also I went foraging the day before and I was able to get all kinds of crazy, wonderful greens that were really fresh and wonderful, even though it was November the 19th. So I just wanted to, and you'll see that when you see my video about nature's wave. Are you ready now, Jace? Okay. And now you can start, start broadcasting in the Tina. Are you done? <clears throat> there it is. Rock okay. Roll. Thanks, Jace. Max will help. Mm. All right. Psalm 33, 5, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So last week we talked about best friends, the kind you never tire of them being around, and good friends that you like to have close by. This week we're talking about friends with boundaries and toxic friends that are not welcome. Um, so I'm going to just skip over all the ones that I did from last week. If you want to see these, you can just go, um, go back and watch last week's class. These are some of my favorites that I cannot live without and I like to bring to my property. Each one has a specific way to bring them to your land. Okay, so these are the good friends that you want to keep close by. There's the sumac that we just had, the sumac aid. Requires very little care. Um, yucca. 
Um, this is such a delicious and nutritious plant. Pounds and pounds of tender buds that come up before the flowers. The flowers have such sweet, crunchy um, petals and the tender seed pods following them. And then the edible seeds make it an absolute must to have on your wild edible um, landscape. So definitely get a yucca. And then wild mustard, you love that, but it just takes over. We talked about the mints and how they need to be grown in containers or you put them where it's not prime real estate because they will grow out of control. Also, they will, if you have them close to each other, they'll cross breed. So keep your mints separated. Yellow dog blackberries. We have lots of blackberries on the mountain, and I, but I've gotten rid of them, all of them, on my land because I have an acre and I really don't need blackberries on my acre when I have them all over the mountain. So they're very invasive, and they're kind of messy and hard to handle, so I kind of like having a location nearby. So always look for that. Autumn olive is so invasive that it's illegal in some states to propagate it, but I love having access to these prolific shrubs, and I really wouldn't mind having them on my acre as well. Amaranth is the number one wild edible plant in protein, and um, but it is kind of overbearing their self seeding. So they'll just keep coming back year after year. So green amaranth, I would definitely put this perennial um, on the outskirts of your garden. Jerusalem artichokes, we just did a whole class on this. You definitely want that away from your garden as well. Very aggressive and invasive, but one of the best wild edible plants you can have. Poke, I love poke. Once it's rooted, it's almost impossible to get rid of this perennial. So I have that on my land. I probably wouldn't have chosen it. It's like right out my back door, but because I have it, I just eat it a lot. So it's best to harvest this from a distance, but um, it's one of those most delicious of all the wild edibles, but it has very special needs as to how you prepare it so that it's safe to eat. So keep it under control by removing all berry clusters in the early fall or just keep pruning it. I like harvesting the berries for ink dye and for other rather iffy reasons that I talk about in my poke class. Poke salad is in the bottom right-hand corner. Comfrey, once that's planted, it's there to stay. So choose really wisely where you plant it. It is good to have a lot of it on your land. Um, but at a little bit of a distance. It's excellent for food. It's for excellent for medicine, for fertilizer. Um, you just take a piece of the root. It doesn't have to be a large piece and stick it in the ground. It needs no care whatsoever. It does like a little bit of sun though. So make sure it has at least part sun to full sun. You can grow it in a container to help keep it contained. But the reason why you want a lot of this is because you can make really powerful manure um, by just making a really deep, thick infusion with the cut up leaves in a five gallon bucket and let it sit for a couple of weeks and it smells worse than manure. And boy, did the plants love it. So this is one of my favorites. Okay. So wild lettuce is another go-to plant. I don't want it really on my land. It's the beginning of all lettuces started with wild lettuce, extremely bitter. Um, you can eat the flower buds. You can see those on the right-hand side. Um, if you let them go to flower puffs, because it's in the Asteraceae family, like a dandelion, you'll never be rid of its babies. So I really would not choose to have a wild lettuce on my land. So when I see it, I rip it up. You can find it anywhere. Garlic mustard is delicious and also pernicious. It's invasive, destructive, and edible. It gains a foothold by emerging earlier in the spring and getting a head start blocking the sunlight and vital nutrients from other native species. And then I got this from the web. It said garlic mustard roots release chemicals that alter the important underground network of fungi that connect nutrients between native plants. So the my mitocillium and inhibiting the growth of important species like trees. So it can literally destroy forest. So you, if you have this on your land, dig it up and get rid of it. Eat it because it's good for you. And ground ivy is another perennial broadleaf weed that invades the turf through aggressive stolons that creep below the turf grass canopy. It forms very dense mat-like patches that effectively crowd out the surrounding turf. 
You can eat it in salads raw, use it to make beer, and there are many medicinal benefits for this plant. And you can get rid of it, um, you, oh, use it while you're ridding your garden of this invasive and pretty weed. It does have, I think when I make a tea out of it, it tastes kind of like perfume and the flowers are beautiful, but like I said, it just takes over and, um, and it keeps other plants you really want from coming. And then Japanese knotweed is terrifying. It is taking over the planet. Never bring, never bring this plant to your land or consciously spread it. Japanese knotweed roots can grow as far as seven meters horizontally and up to three meters deep from each Japanese knotweed shoot. There is no controlling organisms to keep it in check. So it's from Japan. And in Japan, they don't have a problem with it taking over because there are controlling organisms, but there is nothing in the rest of the world. Japanese knotweed that has been able to spread unchecked at the expense of native species often commandeers large swaths of land. As you can see in the picture down on the right, it can pierce concrete and destroy buildings. Even the most minuscule fragments of stem or rhizome can take root and easily replenish and reflourish in the form of new plants. So it's, it's kind of scary. So if you see it coming up, um, because it's, you're living on, on the, along the river or something, and a piece of it had floated down the river and started on your bank, then get rid of it immediately. But you can't put it in a compost bin or you'll start new Japanese knotweed. You literally have to destroy it. Um, so much to say about this plant. I think I did a whole class on it. I'll give you the link below. Cattail. These are the supermarket of the swamp. There is an enormous amount of nutrition in a healthy cattail stand. Um, but you have to have a healthy cattail stand because they are famous for being uh, bioabsorbers. They just suck up toxins and absorb them, which can make them toxic. So you can have an edible plant be toxic if it's in toxic soil. So I have a wonderful cattail swamp nearby that's next to a mountain stream. And so it keeps those cattails clean. Um, and, but you, it's really best to have a destination because if you have a pond on your land and you put cattail seeds there or transplant one over, it really has a way of taking over um, being kind of a mono crop. And you probably would not want that. I, I don't have a pond, but I love cattails. There's so much to say about them. And I did a class on this as well. Okay, kudzu, <clears throat> it can grow a foot a day. In a single summer, it can grow more than 50 feet in every direction and cover the ground four feet deep. The vine can completely cover whole houses, abandoned vehicles, trees, railroad tracks, utility poles, anything and everything that gets in its way. People trying to get rid of it have used everything from hatchets and chainsaws to files, fire and chemicals, but it keeps growing and it keeps coming back. At present, more than 7 million acres of land in the South are covered with kudzu. Look how huge that root is on the right. Um, back in the early 1900s, the government paid farmers to plant kudzu, $8 an acre. So um, that's how it started. And they did that to stabilize the soil because that was when roads were beginning to be made and it was causing all kinds of erosion. And, and kudzu definitely will stabilize the soil. But now we're trying everything to get rid of it. So if you, uh, you can see that house in the picture there completely covered by kudzu. There's all kinds of crazy stories on the internet. You can read about that. The flowers taste like grape. They smell like grape and they make wonderful grape jelly. Well, kudzu jelly. There's a book called 101 Uses for Kudzu that you might want to check out. And um, you can make wonderful starch out of the roots. There's just a lot that you can do with kudzu. So if you can't beat it, then at least learn to uh, use it. And then grass. Don't let grass seed blow into your garden area. So the tenacious roots, roots make it really difficult to remove. However, there are hundreds and hundreds of edible grasses, but that is a topic for another class. So like if your husband's trying to make a nice lawn or something and he's just spreading the seeds of the grass, be very careful that it doesn't get into your garden because it's very difficult to remove. Okay, so let's talk about toxic friends that are not welcome. The Bible says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So having these guys around is harmful. These are problem weeds that you can say no thank you to. 
Um, ragweed is one of them, ambrosia artemisifolia, and it's very easy to rip up the whole plant. Um, but you do this all throughout the spring and the summer before they go to pollen, because once they've gone to pollen, you can see what the pollen looks like. It's like a mace weapon from you know medieval times. And that is what causes the hay fever hell that so many people experience in August. There's two types of ragweed. There's a common ragweed and there's the giant ragweed. You can see the look of the leaves on the common ragweed almost look fern-like. And the giant ragweed has three lobes, like three big fingers, and they can be huge. They can grow up to 10 feet tall. Their pollen is very... Um, just kind of like dull greenish yellow because it's wind pollinated, which is one of the reasons why we have such problems because that pollen gets into our sinuses. So ragweed, just work at getting rid of it. Uh, ground cell, we had talked a lot about this last spring. It produces abundant seeds, which spread by floating on the wind with their parachutes, um, just like dandelion. One ground cell plant can produce as many as 1 million seeds in a season. Their lower heart-shaped leaves look similar to the edible violet, but it has more of a scalloped margin. And you can see in the picture on the top right that there's violets that are edible and wonderful in the same picture as the um, ground cell. So the, I think the way to tell the difference is the violets have much more of a, a elongated heart look to them and they do not have such sharply scalloped margins or edges. So remove these ruthlessly, they become a monocrop, they just completely destroy other plants and they can cause irreversible liver damage and poison livestock. So I have spent many hours ridding my land of ground cell. Buttercups are also so annoying. Um, they spread by creeping stolons and can form mono-specific mats out competing other vegetation. All parts of a buttercup are poisonous for cattle and humans. However, these toxic chemicals in the buttercups degrade during the process of drying. So hay that is made of buttercups can be used in the diet of cattle, which is a good thing because so many fields are literally taken over with, with buttercups. Dig them out. Keep at it or the buttercups will win out over the plants you want to have near you. Okay, and then wild, white snake root, we've talked a lot about that this summer. Um, it contains a cocktail of toxic compounds that can poison goats and other livestock, causing neurological disorders commonly referred to as trembles, and it can be fatal. The toxicity can be passed through the milk, like of milking cows, causing similar problems in humans or nursing young. During the 1800s, when it was common practice to graze livestock in forested or newly cleared areas, um, the so-called milk fever was a common cause of death for the settlers. Such poisoning seems to have subsided as newly cleared land stabilized into established open pasture and livestock were increasingly kept out of the woodlands. Thus, snake root poisoning all but vanished as an issue for generations and knowledge of its dangers diminished. However, with the resurgence of homestead farming and mixed land use, livestock such as goats once again are having a higher chance of encountering white snake root with serious implications for the herd and for humans. This plant is the cause of milk sickness. It is poisonous to cattle and killed many early settlers who drank the poisoned milk, including Abraham Lincoln's mother, which is probably the most famous story. So literally I have spent hundreds of hours getting rid of snake root on our acre, and but it's everywhere. I mean, it's so prolific here in the high country. Okay, and then Japanese daughter vine, um, also called AKA devil's hair, witches, shoelaces, strangleweed, vampire vine. They are, they have no, um, um, I'm trying to think of the word chlorophyll on their own. And um, so they have to find a host that they can suck the life out of and insert their fang-like hostoria into the plant's vascular system. And this can cause all kinds of viruses and it destroys the plant. So the way to get rid of this is to literally rip up the host plant by the roots and you have to put them in bags and take them to the landfill. You can't put it on a compost bin. You can't even burn it. And the seeds will last up to 60 years. So one year, well, I actually wrote a whole blog on this. So I'll give you the link to my blog because I have had quite a fight with Cascuta japonica or Japanese daughter vine.
and you can see the picture in the bottom left where that little tendril is just kind of reaching out to the wild carrot saying, I won't hurt you. And then you can see how it wraps around and just um, strangles everything. It just grows in these spaghetti-like orange mats. Okay, and poison hemlock and water hemlock are super deadly. What's dangerous about this is that they're in the carrot family and so they there's a lot of similarities. So make sure that when you're collecting the wild carrot, that you remember the old adage that a queen has hairy legs and all these poisonous ones have very slick stems and um, they're not hairy like the queen. So I just would, I would just avoid it. I would find out if you've got it. And then if you do, make sure you cut off all of the flower heads before they go to seed because they spread by seed dispersal. And that will um, discourage the, gr the growth if you keep at it. Okay, and then poison ivy is also infamous. Um, here's different stages of it. Even in the winter, you can get the horrible rash from the oil. So I've had a, quite a fight with this as well, trying to get it off my land. And it almost seems like the more I work with it, you have to uproot it. Um, it comes back somewhere else on my acre, but I will never give up. Okay, I love this verse. It says, those who dwell in the garden, let me hear your voice. All right, so now we're gonna watch our slideshow, which will show you the adventures I had this week. And then we'll have some closing comments. Oh no, we have Heather. Um, I think the slideshow is just like four minutes. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, so I have a very special guest all the way from California. This is my dear friend, Heather Pierre. We're total kindred spirits. We've known each other mm, about 12 years, but I've never met her in person. Um, she has quite a history in herbalism and foraging. Um, in fact, it's because of foraging that she's even alive. So I can't wait for her to tell that story to you. But let me tell you some more about her. She was an actress in Hollywood for years. Um, Heather, what were some of your movies that you did? Um, I did more commercial work than I did movies. Um, there okay. are movies here and there. I had an IMDPH, but um, most of my money came from commercial work. So um, yay for pharmaceutical money. Yay. <laughs> okay. And then she's also a veterinarian, which is really helpful because she has had so many animals and um, service dog that just passed away. But um, she's just a wonderful resource. Um, we've reached out to her when Max has issues because she's a, um, a vet as well. So she just loves all things with nature and um, she's a kindred spirit. So the reason why I've asked Heather on is because we are talking about how to use wild edible plants for survival. And we've been talking about Jerusalem artichokes as being the ultimate survival crop. But there's so many fun, um, amazing plants that we can have on our property or in a pot in our front porch that are free and provide even more nutrition than what you could purchase in the store. So I would love to have Heather share her story. And then later she's going to come back and share with us what are her top plants that she wants, she recommends that she will always have um, around where you live. So go ahead and tell us your story, Heather, about why foraging is why you're alive. So my mother um, was raised from the time she was 14 years old and on in Nazi occupied France. And times were difficult. Um, her father had uh, dropped dead while waiting in a line for his ration. He was allowed one cigar a week and he had his ration coupon and he would stand in line for um, that cigar. And that was his great pleasure in life was to have that cigar after uh, his Sunday evening. And one day he just dropped dead in the line. And that left my mother, who was 14 years old, with his, her stepmother. And I remember my stepmother, her name was Mamie. She was a very, um, she was beautiful. She was egotistical. She, um, she never let me know how old she was. Um, we never celebrated her birthday. We celebrated her Saints Day. She was a Catholic, um, but she, she was very well educated. She spoke many languages and one of them was Yiddish. And according to my mother, my stepmother looked Jewish sounded Jewish and had Jewish mannerisms. And that's very difficult for me as a little California girl to get my mind around that particular stint in time when how you looked could send you to a concentration camp. But because of that, my mother was, my grandmother was afraid to leave the house. So that left my mother to try to find food for them. And there was no food. The Germans took all of the food. So they were left to forage. And um, eventually, um, under the cover of the night, they rode bicycles into the south of France um, under the Vichy government, hoping that there would be more food there. And of course, there wasn't. Um, but in the south of France, they made things like bread puddings in the ovens. And um, my mother always said that a bread, good bread pudding saved her life. Um, she eventually lost all of her teeth due to starvation. But they did forge. They forged for nettles. They forged for chicory. They forged for, um, what else was there? Lamb's quarters. And if you read history, you'll read um, a book called, uh, about books about the siege of Leningrad. And in history, you'll look through. Um, the siege lasted oh, three or four years, 1941 to 1945, 44, excuse me. Um, and the first year, the majority of people died and people were eating things like a sugar plant burned down and they were eating the charcoal out of it. They were eating their pets. They were eating corpses. Um, but someone had gone to a park and written under a, bri the, a bridge, eat the nettles, eat the dandelions, eat the um, goose feet. Those will keep you alive. I don't know how people, many people took up that advice, um, but it's certainly something, that bit of history is something that I took into my heart and it has been um, sort of my passion um, yeah. I was very fortunate in college to have a professor who had um, 
done her uh, graduate work on on living off, not her graduate work, her sabbatical. She had lived off the land in a little cabin in Montana, um, taught me about canning, taught me about the plants. We would have big parties where it was uh, bring your own forage dish. Um, it was a great deal of fun. And when I came out here to California, I just kind of carried on with it. Um, I had a magazine. It's still available online. It's uh, one of the issue magazines, and you'll, you can easily find it. Um, covers everything from acorns to um, olive oil, um, really anything is, that you could possibly your imagine. Magazine? Yes, my magazine. Oh my gosh, um, how come I don't know I'm, about this? I'm sorry, I thought that you did. It's, uh, there are a few issues still left online. It was free to anyone who wanted. Um, you look under um, wildness, the art, of, art and craft of foraging, and just for an example, look up acorn alchemy and that will pop up. And you can read the magazine, all the articles, see the pictures. Um, it's a good one to start with. How long did you do that for? Um, I think I did it for three or four years and my husband became quite ill and I couldn't, just couldn't manage it anymore. Wow, I can't wait to go look that up. Send me the link and then I'll give that to our um, Wild Blessings people. That's exciting. Yeah, You're it was. Amazing. Thank you. So are you, Kali, so are you. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to get her to move out here to North Carolina. She I've been is. Playing that she really for is. For a long time. <laughs> but it's going to involve I, I moving your piano, and I just can't move your piano. That's my big. Can't get my mind around the darn piano right these days. Oh, for heaven's sakes! Who cares about the piano? It's those uh, 100 fruit trees. I would have a hard time moving. Uh, it's Mandarin season, Mandarin and persimmon season right now, and it, and it does keep me busy. You have Mandarin oranges. Uh -huh. oh. It's kind of kind of big in this area. We have a lot. It's kind. Of, we have a Mandarin trail, much as other counties have wine trails or apple wow. hill trails or whatever. We have the Mandarin wow. trail. We have a lot of lot of farms here with mandarins. It's a very popular fruit. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome! Well, I saw you post that you had pomegranate tree. I do have a lot of pomegranates. I'm and I guess if it came to, when it comes down, because really I think that your Purve here is talking about um, the plants that you would need to carry on in case there's a burp in society, in case there's something, and, and who knows what could happen. Um, I tend well, don't, to... Don't share um, about those yet, because that's... Okay, really all right. Week. Okay, so all right. So next week, I'm, I'm giving, I'm going to be talking about the wild garden, and I'm going to mm -hmm. be talking about, um, you're the, what, what is it that people say, you're the sum of the friends or the average of the friends that you have around you. Correct. And so um, thinking about what plants you don't want to have around you because they're a bad influence and they take over or the plants that you can't have enough of. And so that'll be kind of my stick. Mm -hmm. And that'll be when I have you share that, but you can share that with me now, but then I'll share sure. it next week. But sure. I just wanted to ask a few more questions about um, sure. your story. So I'm sorry, but why did your dad die i don't i don't understand was it was it because he was starving uh, oh. no 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 he dropped dead of a stroke my grandfather my grandfather dropped oh, grandfather. dead of a stroke while standing okay. in a rations line and that okay. left my mother alone 14 years old with her stepmother who couldn't leave the house so um really survival depended on my mother and what she could manage um okay. it was a difficult time she eventually did there was so little food she did eventually lose her teeth to starvation um, oh, wow. Well, I remember but, when your mother was alive, you would write about the funniest things that she would do. And she was very intelligent and clever and funny. And um, and of course, you you would capture that in such a, a compelling way that I just felt like, oh, I wish I knew that woman. She just sounded like a I, real hoot. I, you have been there as well, taking care of your elder, which is what we do. Um, and it, you have to be able to appreciate the humor that is in that situation because it can be very difficult if you don't. Um, so just <laughs> well, appreciate and, you embraced and it. yeah, give them love and, and enjoy the humor and make the most of it. And um, yeah, my mother used to say, your father came to visit me last night and he's still an SOB. Um, and my <laughs> father had been dead for 10 years. So um, you have to learn to, to roll with that and, and take with and just encourage them and give them love and accept them. Of course. Um, so did your 
grandmother. Okay, so I find that interesting that just because your your grandmother looked like she was Jewish. She looked I mean, like she was Jewish. She, she spoke like she Yiddish. Jewish. She spoke Jewish, which is Yiddish. She spoke that yeah. language. She spoke many other languages as well. She's very well educated. I have a picture of her at the Polish embassy. She's very dressed up in a very severe black dress with obviously the tight girdle. She's seated. There are all these Polish men standing around her. And I asked her, I said, what did you do for the Polish embassy? Were you a secretary? And she never told me. She just looked at me and said, oh, honey, I don't type. So that was my, my grandmother. Um, never was entirely sure what she did at the embassy, but she was a tremendous businesswoman. She amassed, um, when she came to the United States, uh, she came after my mother did. Um, she did quite well in real estate, which kind of surprised wow. me. Um, you wouldn't think that a little old lady from Europe could, uh, she worked for the Folger family, not the Folger company, but the Folger family and, and did their books. And she was she was quite a businesswoman. Wow. So back to foraging. So um, uh -huh. did they tell you stories about how they would find the nettle and how they would find the lamb's quarter and how they would fix it? Or it No, just... there, there was no joy in any of their stories for that. This was survival and this was necessity. And I think that some of the stories weren't terribly pretty, so they didn't share them with me. Um, it was just mm -hmm. like, oh, I recognize this, we ate this, walking around in our yard in California because we have those plants here. So she would tell me, oh, I recognize this. And, and we went into other plants as well. We went into the California ones that, because we have the um, miner's lettuce here and we have the soap root. And she recognized those, even though they aren't something that she would have in Europe. She was an intelligent woman. She was, uh, mm -hmm. she was the last librarian in my town, but she recognized those and recognizes them, recognized them as food and introduced me to them and kind of created that feeling and that wonder and that sense of curiosity because um, yeah. it was kind of cool to have your mom talking to you about that stuff. Well, and it our medicine. common sense. It was all part yeah. of our heritage. My, it was. Uh, my, husband, my husband is actually alive because of dandelions because my uh, mother-in-law, his grandmother, his uh, Athena, her, his yaya, they were Greek. Um, they had 10, she had 10 children and they lived in one little tiny apartment and um, in Lowell, Massachusetts. And Yaya would go across the street to the park and she would gather dandelion leaves and roots and she would make a broth out of it and the, with the leaves and then the, and the roots. And then the family would, um, they lived above a bakery and the baker would give them their day old bread. So they would have day old bread and they would sop up the dandelion liquor, pot liquor, right. and eat the greens. And that was their dinner every night, except for on Sunday, they would get a piece of meat. So honestly, uh, Jason's mom really wasn't impressed with dandelion at all, but she lived to be in her 90s, and she was so healthy. And um, I think that all of her siblings lived for a very long time. I believe the dandelion is what was, gave them such a strong... Um, foundation. A so big she, part of it was her name was Athena. It, she was a god. You know? <laughs> yeah. But she used to think, Holly, why are you wanting to do foraging? That's, that's, I mean, to her, that meant poverty. But, exactly. Uh, and, and, and I do understand that. Yeah. Um, one, one time when I was in high school, um, I went to the grocery store and I bought a bag of mussels and they were, I think $14 for this huge bag of mussels back then, which I'm sure they're, they're much more. And I brought them home and my father was aghast because he had grown up very poor. He had actually been in the poorhouse in Nova Scotia. And he said that to him, that was what poor people eat. And he was not poor and I had to get it out of the house. That was very much imprinted in his head. Wow. Um, that there are some things that poor people eat. He was one, he recognized it. He wasn't poor anymore and he was not going to eat even though he loves seafood in all shapes and forms, mussels yeah. were not going on his table because they represented a certain darkness to him, a certain wow. part of the past. He would not eat them. I wonder how much our children appreciate the stories of their ancestors. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure yeah. about that. Because I know I really, we do. We appreciate it. Yeah. But I, I and, and I as well. I'm still learning part of the stories of my family. Um, my, fa my family, my father's family was so dark. He didn't talk about it. And now that he's passed, 
many of the relatives are coming forward and forward and kind of telling me some of these stories. And I'm, some of them are absolutely shocking to me. My father was in a poorhouse when he was 12 years old. Mm. What the heck? You know, yeah. where's your, chi where's your childhood? My father ran away from the poorhouse and crossed the border into the United States illegally when he was 12 years old and wow. made it all By the way himself? to California. By himself. By himself? No, Whoa. no grownups. Yeah, this is this is beyond our level of comprehension. I think it's certainly beyond mine. Well, um, it explains why you are who you are, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you're pretty awesome. Okay, so well, thank you so much, Heather. And um, next week, Heather. Well, she's going to share with us now, but well, next week I'll share with you um, the th plants that she thinks need to be in everyone's yard. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, if you want to see the plants she's interested in in everyone's yard, that was from last week. All right, so let's talk about um, our field work for this week. Um, it's I just really think that it's you learn by doing. So go around and gather your seed heads that you've got on your land or somewhere of organic farm or whatever, and then learn how to. Uh, winnow out their seeds or to get their seeds out. And it's really interesting because we're learning about the plant from when it's a little tiny baby, little seed, uh, little, you know, tiny leaves and stuff. And as it grows and it has its buds, and then you learn by its flower and you learn by its seed pod. And then these are the seeds. So like I, these are irises, which are by the way, not edible, but these seeds, look at how big they are. So can you learn, can you, if I had all of these seeds, excuse me, out on the counter, would you be able to say, oh yeah, that's an iris seed and that's an echinacea seed and oh, that's a burdock seed. And, um, and then can you learn how to propagate them? So I have a really wonderful book as well that I'll be um, giving the, the a picture of and then it's a DK during Kinderly's book called Plant Propagation on how to just propagate almost any plant. So one of the ones that I think you all need the most is burdock. And so what I did is I took these burrs and I put them into this little jar and I'm just kind of pounding them down because they really get into your skin and they're a pain in the neck and then out come the seeds. So when I'm done with that, I will have, I like to keep all of my seeds in different labeled jars so that I can have them to put where I want them. And um, so your homework assignment for this week would be to go around and collect as many seed heads of the edible plants that you want and then save them into jars. Some seeds will last for year, hundreds of years. Others like dandelion will only last for a few years. So, um, but they're so prolific, it doesn't matter. Okay, the other thing you can do, next week we'll be teaching, I'll be teaching on creating with creation and playing with nature. And that'll be really fun. And so one of the things that you can do with that is just as you spend time with the Lord outside this week on your hiking habit at your sit spots and stuff, look for gifts that he has hidden all around. It could be fungus. It can be moss. It can be fern. I can't believe I actually found a goldenrod flower. That was crazy. It can be feathers. It can be bark. It can be seed pods, whatever, collect it. And then you can use that as I'm going to be sharing with you next week, a lot of different things that we can make with nature scraps for Christmas presents, for games, for toys, for children. Um, you know, <laughs> There's no reason to not just embrace all of the plant, even its scraps to play with. So that'll be fun for next week. And I will have some children here to make crafts afterwards and that'll be a great time. So I'm looking forward to that. And thank you so much for joining me. Yes, Jason. If you're on YouTube. Oh, if you're on YouTube and you like this, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. And then um, if you would like to join me on Patreon and help me keep these classes free, that would be really helpful. I would love that. And um, did I miss anything? Oh, if you want to join Wild Blessings with Holly Drake, it's a private Facebook group. I would love to have you join me. Just to let me know. I do have lots of blogs at wildblessings.com that I hope to update this winter, but during my winter pause. But that is going to be uh, in the comments below as well. Thank you for joining me. I hope this has been helpful. I cannot wait to see how you plan out your intentional wild garden.